chairman of the Nigerian Deposit Insurance Corporation, NDIC, has said 37 microfinance bank, MFBs, were listed for closure in the first quarter of 2020. She said this during a chat with the theme, a conversation on deposit insurance, banking supervision, failure resolution and bank liquidation in Nigeria. She, most of the, she said most of the MFBs and primary mortgage banks, PMBs, don't meet the conditions to rescue them. The banks could no longer pay their depositors, cessation of businesses and persistent non-rendition of monthly returns. She said there was clear indication of failure in the first quarter. PMBs had issued has insured deposits of 112 billion naira, but non-performing loans was 65 billion naira. The chairman said breach banks were a temporary arrangement meant to acquire the assets and liabilities of a failed bank until final resolution is achieved and to ensure stability in the financial system. Joining us now is Dr. Kubi Ud Udofia, legal practitioner. It's a pleasure to have you join us on the news. Last week, at your fireside chat, the chairman of NDIC disclosed that 37 MFBs had been listed to be shut down. This is quite a large number. Couldn't the NDIC have acted to save these banks? Okay, thank you very much for having me. Um, yes, um, okay, so the banks were actually, their licenses were actually revoked by the CBN and they were handed over to the NDIC for liquidation. And the procedure is that before this is done, they would first and foremost consider a resolution or rescuing these banks or saving them. But one has to know that it's not in every case that a rescue or resolution is practicable, or else you end up you know, spending so much fun or wasting so much scarce resources in, in, in trying to rescue non-viable banks. So I guess, this option may have been examined by the regulators, and they found out that, look, a rescue wasn't going to be practicable or feasible, and thereafter decided to liquidate them. And besides, most of these banks, reports have it that most of them had even ceased operating for a couple of months or years. And so this announcement is merely, I mean, a mere formality. They have to be oddly wound up and then eased out of the system. And one more point is that banks, the regulators have to be a bit cautious in the way they go about rescuing. I mean, they can't rescue every distressed or failing bank, or that would give rise to what experts call moral hazard. And this is encouraging bank executives or officials to act recklessly, knowing that they would always be rescued if something goes wrong. All right, what will be the fate of the depositors and creditors of these MFBs? Okay, so for the depositors, there is currently a deposit insurance scheme being administered by the NDIC. So for the um, for microfinance bank, I think the current protection limit is 200,000 Naira per deposit. So they are going to be given this 200 Naira per deposit. Depositors who are entitled to such claims will have to you know, put in their claims and they will be settled. In the case of creditors, their case is a bit dicey because um, bank resolution or bank liquidation is not like ordinary company liquidation where creditors are given priority. So what would happen to them is they have to wait on the queue and wait for NDIC to liquidate the banks and see if there are assets that can be sold so they'll be paid what's called liquidation dividends. And if there are recoveries that can be made from their cost of this bank, they can be paid from those recoveries, you know, what I call um, liquidation dividends. Do you think these closures may adversely impact government's policy of financial inclusion? That's an interesting one. Um, in my opinion, I do not think it would. Um, to, to start with, this is not the first time we're having uh, microfinance banks being liquidated or shut down. It's almost something that's become a routine. Every year we have it. I, I recall in 2018, about... 154 banks, microfinance banks, were shut down after their licenses were uh, had been revoked by the CBN. So it's something that has become routine. And besides, I'm aware that as of December 2019, we had about 913 microfinance finance banks spread across the across the country, and these are capable of servicing the needs of people in the rural areas. 
So I don't think it would actually affect government policy or financial inclusion. Uh, the NDIC chairman also highlighted the benefits of bridge banking and stressed that it is a temporary measure. But Polaris Bank has been a bridge bank for two years. Is this not contradictory? No, I do not think it's contradictory. If I can remember that um, Polaris Bank was established in September 2018. So it's not even up to two years yet. And I, I believe that the um, COVID-19 pandemic may have slowed down things. So I don't think it's self-contradictory. I think the regulators, I believe they are still on course. And with time, they'll find credible investors for Polaris Bank. Uh, what happens if investors are not found for Polaris Bank? <laughs> that, that, that would be a worst case scenario, I believe. And I do not envision that happening. And, and, and my you know, belief is based on the facts on the ground. At the moment, Polaris Bank appears to be extremely...